Hi, my name is Emil. I work at Akit. I do the technical stuff over there. I've been working on this for about seven years to get to the point where we are now. So One of the things I did is um, to get a bonded connection that would actually work in an oil field environment. And today I'll try to explain what it takes to bond two pieces of composite pipe together. I prepared a uh, little sketch. It consists of a pipe, this one, the inner is the pipe, and a collar, and it's glued together with an adhesive layer in black. Now this is actually showing just half of the connection, because on the other side there would normally be another pipe with another bond line, but I left that out for simplicity reasons. So we're focusing on half the joint here. I'm pointing out the middle of the, of the connection now, the middle of the collar here. To make things a little bit more easy, I'm going to remove the bottom half because this is a cross section. So I'm also going to remove the center line, but we all know we're looking at a cross section or half a cross section of a bonded joint. Now the thing is, um, any joint of this type is affected by the stiffness of the substrate or the material that you try to bond together. And composite materials are relatively flexible. Um, compared to steel, they're even 10 times more flexible. The Young's modulus of steel is roughly 200 gigapascal, and the Young's modulus of um, glass fiber epoxy material is about 20 gigapascal. So that's a factor 10 more flexible. And what that does is it creates stress peaks over any bonded joint. Um, if I put a tensile load on this material here, a little arrow, and on the other side that load is balanced with another force. Um, for every given tensile load there is um, uh, relative to the Young's modulus, there is an elongation as a result. So basically, the collar as well as the pipe will stretch as an effect of the tensile load. Now, at this point, where I'm putting this little red marker, the elongation of that pipe is going to be 100% relative to the load that we put on it. On the other side, the same thing happens in this area, there's also going to be a 100% elongation relative to the load. But, because the load is transferred through the bonded joint, and the load is gradually reduced over the length of the, of the, of the bond line. And that means that eventually at the, at the tip end, here, the load is zero. And that all means that the elongation as a result of the load is also zero. The same goes for the other tip here. So now we have it. The red markers, they show the 100% load, uh, load and 100% elongation. And the blue markers, they show 0% load and 0% elongation. What does that mean? That actually means that this point with the 100% load will actually want to move away in this direction from the joint. And on the other side as well, this point will actually literally want to move away into that direction. But it cannot because it's being held by the glue. As a result, you will get stress peaks at the beginning and at the end of a joint. So if I were to make a little plot of uh, the shear stress that we will see over this joint, on the vertical I will have the shear stress and on the horizontal axis is the length of the joint. So here we have stress and here we have length. Now in our situation the stress distribution graph over the length of the joint will look something like this. As you can see, there are very large peaks at the beginning and at the end. Um, you wouldn't be surprised if the peak here was something like 
80 megapascals. And in the middle, you would only see one or two, perhaps. Um, and because of this dramatic difference, you can see that um, not every bit of adhesive is taking the same load. So the beginning of the joint is overloaded and the middle of the joint is underloaded. Ideally, you would want a horizontal graph. You would want something like this. Now that can be achieved by making the substrates, so the pipe and the color material, infinitely stiff, or it can be achieved by tuning the stiffnesses to the materials you have at hand. So in order to uh, distribute the load evenly over the length of the joint and to make it uh, most of the, uh, of the adhesive material a similar load, we are designing joints where we tune the stiffnesses and the geometry of all the materials so they match up. If we don't do that, we will always see a progressive failure of the joint because um, 80 megapascals is way beyond what, what any glue, what any commercially available glue would do. So if it's loaded up, it would, it would fail at the, at the peak. And what happens then is that um, the peak will not reduce if it fails, but it will just move. So if, for instance, on the right side of the joint, there would be an initial failure, the graph will change to something like this. But the peak, the height of the peak will be just the same. And again, uh, the glue will fail because of it. And this is what we call a progressive failure along the bond line. When it fails, when we test these pipes and when we test these joints, you don't see it as a progressive failure because the failure happens in a fraction of a second. But if you slow it down and have a high-speed camera on it, you would be able to see that the fracture moves from one end to the other and thereby destroying the entire, entire joint. Now, um, infinitely stiff materials do not exist, but if you were to try this in a steel pipe and a steel collar, the problem would be already be a lot less because, uh, like I said earlier, 10 times more stiffness means that the peaks are greatly reduced. Um, and for the same token, we could also incorporate, for instance, carbon fiber into our composite material that would increase the stiffness dramatically and would also reduce this problem of peak stress. Now, this is nothing new. Um, if you want to read back up on it, you can investigate a guy named Fulkerson, who has explained this in detail already in the 1950s or somewhere around there. Um, so we're just solving an old problem that um, is a little bit magnified by the fact that we are using composites. Now for many applications uh, we don't want to use carbon fiber because it will ruin the uh, see-through logging properties. So we have to stick with glass fiber and its inherent flexibility. Now I'm going to erase a little bit of this. Okay, like I said earlier, what we do is we change the geometry and we change the stiffness of the materials to match up and to get a more evenly distributed load over the length of the joint. Simply put, what we do is we vary the thickness of the bond line. So in the beginning of the joint, our bond line is relatively thick. And I'm exaggerating this to no end, but it just shows you what we do. Right, so to the solution. Um, I'm going to switch back to the other screen. This is roughly the shape of the glue, and it's, it's highly exaggerated, but it will show you that there is a thick volume of glue at the end of the bond line, there is a thinner bond line in the middle, and again at the other end there is a, th a lot of volume, a thick bond line again. And what this does, this allows the part that wants to elongate as a, as a result of the, the load and as the stress that you put on it, because we said here we have this 100% and this bit wants to move to the right. Now, if this bond line were just as thin here as it was in the middle, it would not be able to move more than it would be in the middle. But by making it thicker, we allow 
this volume of adhesive to stretch a little bit along with the pipe. And that mitigates the stress peak at the end of the joint. Same thing goes on the other side. Um, this point was 100% loaded, the red marker, remember? And this point actually wants to move to the left because of the elongation in the substrate, in the pipe material in this case. And here also, the big volume of adhesive um, allows for this point to move to the left without the adhesive being overstressed and failing. Let me bring the graph back up. Remember, here we had the length of the joint and here we have the stress over the joint. And what we used to have when we had a, st a straight bond line with no stiffness tuning whatsoever was this graph with these really high peaks beginning at the end. Now, by making this tuning, and that is, doesn't just mean the, the geometry of the thing, but it also means the stiffness of the adhesive and the uh, change in stiffness due to temperature, the stiffness of the substrate, and the, stiff the stiffness of the substrate is again a result of the fiber layup. So we also design the layup to match the, the, the properties of the joint. So, for instance, if we put more fibers in the longitudinal direction or more fibers in the circumfer circumferential direction, we can again tune the stiffnesses in various directions. So what we end up with is a graph that is slightly varying, but it hovers around 7 MPA. And 7 is a lot different from 80, as we said before. 7 is something that most glues can easily do. Uh, an average glue will do, at a, at a reasonable temperature rating, will do 15 to 20 MPA. So 7 is something we can work with. The other important thing is that if, for whatever reason, 7 is too high, which, for instance, if we have a very high temperature situation, the glue is, is more flexible than we would like because of that and, and has less strength because of the high temperature, we, we are also free to make the joint longer. So in the previous situation with these high peaks, if I were to make the joints longer, I would just space the peaks further apart and the middle bit, which is carrying no load, would be extended. So that doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. But because we've mitigated all that by tuning the stiffnesses, we are also able to make the joint stronger. Because now, when we make the joint longer, we actually have something that works, because the whole joint works around 7 megapascals shear stress. And also when we make it longer, it will still work around 7 megapascals. And there we have given ourselves a system that we can use to play with and to tune our joints uh, according to the requirement of the well, the well design uh, that's uh, around that, that issue. So there you have it. Um, the mitigation of shear stress and shear lag. This is the, the process, this is the official name, shear lag, if you want to look it up, um, that we have uh, worked around. Thank you very much.